so good morning everybody. Uh, congratulations are in order because we've made it about halfway through Ecclesiastes. Now you're like, but we're only in chapter five. And that's true, that's true, but we're in week six, which is exciting. So as both a sort of celebration and as a makeup, sorry, because I forgot the one week that I was gonna use it as an illustration. I did bring in my bridal bouquet. So if you oh. want to look at it at any point, not during the lesson, ideally. <laughs> Because that'll be slightly distracting. But after afterwards, if you want to come up and be like, "Oh my gosh, that totally looks fake," you can come up and do that. But so that that was my my sort of grace gift to say I'm sorry. So congratulations, we made it about halfway through. Um, and I want to say, you know, give yourselves a little bit of a round of applause. Like, give yourselves a round of applause because this is this book is no joke, right? And every time I go through Ecclesiastes, I inevitably pause at certain sections, and I'm like. At one point in time, like I know that I understood what was going on in this section, and now I, I have to go back and refigure it out. So, um, hold on, you guys, we're, we're trekking through. Thank you for your perseverance, and I do pray that as we're working through both the lessons and the application questions, that the Spirit helps to bring these verses alive to each one of us, and that we become more like Christ each day. So we're doing a recap. A little brief recap of the last section, 3, 16 through 22, and 4, 1 through 16. Uh, remember, we talked about Kohelet is looking at an under-the-sun sort of perspective, and he's describing all of these things that he's observing. We looked at the unfairness of injustice, and that was both the end of 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. We looked at some good attitudes about work and then some not-so-good attitudes about work. Kohelet says, we have, we have to work. So what's the best way to navigate that in life? And we looked at, at sort of again the two sides of the coin. We have the benefits of friendship and then on the other side of the coin, the folly of popularity comes to the conclusion like, okay, well, this too is kind of pebble. This is frustrating. This isn't the, the be all, end all as we're uh, going through life. Now, as we merge into this next section here, I sort of, I, the, the title of this slide was funny because mom, mom was looking over my slide and she was like, did you mean for this to be the title of your slide? And I said, yes. <laughs> Transition needed for flow. Uh, as you guys know, I uh, grade a lot of papers and this is a comment that I will frequently put on my students' papers. Hey. Transition needed for a flow. You just sort of stopped this point and then you started this next point. And that's the feeling we kind of get is we're going from this previous section into this next one. We ended, we were talking about the folly of popularity and all of a sudden we're talking about entering the house of God and you're like, oh, hello, what's going on? Transition needed for a flow, right? Um, However, let's think, let's think through the flow a little bit more intentionally and sort of see where he's going here. Remember, we started off in the first couple of chapters and we talked about how there doesn't seem to be any lasting gain. We looked at toil, wisdom, and pleasure, and Kohelet looked through and he's like, hey, my conclusion, all is hevel. All is insubstantial and is unable to provide that lasting satisfaction and impact. And at the close of that section, we had our first enjoy life refrain. God is first brought to the forefront, and he, he's the first time that he's really mentioned in the book. And uh, we see that God's the one who gives the ability to find enjoyment, as well as we said that there's that, that wisdom and knowledge and pleasure, all of that comes from God. And so that, that was our first sort of vertical glance up for, you know, we've been saying that this is a horizontal sort of survey of life, but this is Kohelet, he's looking up and saying, but even so, God has given us these grace gifts and to enjoy. And then in chapter three, God came into the picture again. Uh, he's the one who sees the entire tapestry of life. He establishes the times in our lives and he imbues both big things and the small things with meaning. Now there are two enjoy life refrains in this section. Um, we have the one sort of saying, okay, it is better to do good and all of these things are God's gift. And then the second one reminding us that in light of that humble estate that we have, uh, we ought to receive the allotment that God has given us with joy. And all of that leads to that center point of fear in God in 314. So, as we transition into chapter four then, we have 
have the series of better than statements where we, again, we just reviewed under the sun, all of these things exist. So what is the, the path that the wise person should take? What is the best way to navigate life? And we looked at all of these things, wisdom versus folly. And sometimes as Kohelet acknowledges, you can't help being in a situation because, you know, you just can't help it. But more often than not, unfortunately, I can find this to be true of my life as well. We're dealing with situations because we were foolish. And so Kohelet is trying to help us uh, navigate those, those sections. And now Kohelet is going to circle back to the topic of the fear of God. And he's going to develop it more thoroughly in the context of what is better? What is the best way for the wise person to navigate life in the presence of God in the context of our Hebel world? And he's going to contrast that with what the fool does before a divine God. Now, as we look in chapter 5, we're also going to see that there's a noticeable shift in voice. So there's a shift in topic and there's a shift in voice. And Kohelet, for the first time, is shifting to a direct second person voice, which means that you're, he's using the word, uh, he's talking to the readers directly. Now, again, I teach writing, and so, uh, and it's not just writing, but it's formal academic writing, and so I tell my students, don't, don't use you. Don't talk to the readers directly, don't get up close, don't get in their face, don't do it, because it's too personal for the type of writing that you're doing. Now, what we've seen so far in Ecclesiastes is, is, is that Kohelet has used third person, so he's just sort of described stuff. And he's used first person. He says, hey, I saw, I perceived. And again, remember that in Hebrew argumentation, it's that sort of circular development of argument. So the first few sections, Kohelet has been sort of developing his credibility here. He's been saying, okay, this is what I see. This is what I observe. This makes sense. And he sort of brought the reader to a point of being ready to receive that direct instruction. So now is the first time he's, it's bringing to the forefront and saying, okay, now I'm going to speak to you directly, look you in the eyeballs and give you my first set of uh, explicit instructions. So let's take a look at the first couple of verses here. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Now, the thesis of the, the whole section, we're just going to sort of throw it out there, is that to fear and revere God is better than, well, than to not. Better than to not. Mom, my, mom, my mom's here today. She would remember the, the alligator eats the thing that's bigger. So this is what I always remember. The alligator eats the thing that's bigger. So to revere is better than, is greater than to not. Um, when you're considering your interactions with the divine, and this is particularly in the context of the temple, we're going to see the house of God is a in the context of going to the temple to worship, it's better to be reverent than not. And throughout this section, Kohelet is going to develop what reverence looks like, as well as why it's better to be reverent than not. Uh, but we're, we're going to uh, dive into that in just a section, uh, dive into that in a second. Now we don't, as far as I'm aware, none of us worship at a temple with sacrifices today. And if you're like, no, 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 on, on Saturdays, I go, then, then you can let me know. We'll sort of adjust here. But the, the general principles that Kohelet's going to go over do still apply. So let's look at his first injunction here. The first, very first phrase is to guard your steps. Now your, your guys' brains may not be exactly like mine, but the image that pops into my head when I hear the word guard your steps is something kind of like that, where I have this knight in shining armor sort of like defending off intruders, be like, okay, protect your way. But that's not exactly what Kohelet is going for here. Uh, basically, as you look through the context of the rest of the section, it's going to be clear that whenever we approach God for worship, be careful. Uh, and this, right off the bat, again, this is his thesis. He's not, he hasn't explained it yet, but this is sort of our overview. He's letting us know up front, this is what the rest of the section is going to be about. Whenever you get ready to worship, don't just sort of jump into it full, all full passion forward. Take a second. Here's your initial warning. Now, the second half, to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. 
whenever you run into the phrase, the sacrifice of fools, I don't, again, I don't know about you, but I stop and I'm like, well, what the heck is the sacrifice of fools? Like, that's not something that we use in our everyday vocabulary. And so in order to understand this first better than section, we have to sort of contrast it with the, the front half. So to draw near, to listen. So we can assume for, from the context that drawing near to listen has to do with worship. So coming into the temple and whenever they went into worship, they wouldn't just go in and offer sacrifices. They would also hear the word of God preached. And so let's back up for a second and think about what we know from other parts of scripture, what God desires from people who go in and worship. And over and over again throughout scripture, uh, the Bible affirms that God is not so much interested purely in the sort of form of the thing where people just sort of show up and do the thing and then leave, but he's interested in your heart and he's interested in a, a change that starts on the inside and then trickles out into your behavior. And let's look at a couple of couple of verses here. So Proverbs 21, 3 says, To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Another passage that you could consider is uh, in 1 Samuel 15. This is the story of King Saul and the Amalekites. And what happens? So God gives him this command. And he says, hey, I want you to completely wipe out the Amalekites. And Saul says, I got it. And what does he do? He, he does it. Right? He reserves all of this livestock. And whenever Samuel, the prophet, comes in to sort of check on him, he's like, is it, I have to read the verse because it's, 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 it's beautiful. He's like, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? And Saul's like, oh, well, I mean, I kind of destroyed them all. I just saved a few for the Lord for sacrifice. And probably not just for sacrifice. You, I don't know. I, that's what he said. He's like, I saved them all for sacrifice. And Samuel's like, no, no, no. No, no, no. That's, that's not what God wants. What does God want? He wants obedience rather than sacrifice. He wants you to actually do what he says. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about the, the actual offerings. Um, I love Psalm, Psalm 50 has uh, this sort of listing out of, uh, he says some things that are good about the Israelites, and then he sort of levels some injunctions against them. And what he says in verse 8 is really interesting. So I bring no charges against you concerning your sacrifices or concerning your burnt offerings, which are ever before me. I have no need of a bull from your stalls or of the goats from your pens. For every forest is my, animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. And we will frequently talk about, oh, my dad owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? But what's the point? Does God need our sacrifices? No. No. No, he doesn't. And he's, he goes on later in the song, he's like, I'm not hungry. Like, it's not like I'm hungry, like waiting for you to sacrifice an animal. Like, oh my gosh, can you please give me a sacrifice? So that's not, that's not the point of the sacrifice. He, he wants our hearts. If you show up with your tithes and your offerings and your songs and your prayers, but you're not living in, in such a way that, that demonstrates that God's working in your heart, he's not impressed by our offerings. And so whenever we look back to this passage, then what does the fool do? The person who is not thinking rightly about God. He does the technically correct thing, right? He shows up with the sacrifice. But he doesn't have a heart underneath that is ready to repent and ready to change. The fool does not listen. And so then even though they show up at the Lord's house and they hear his word, they don't hear it, right? They don't hear it in such a way that it makes a difference. And so they are unaware of how their lifestyle transgresses God's word. That's, how, that's why they, they don't know that they're doing evil. They've missed it. They've missed the heart of what's going on. It's kind of like if you were going to go to a bridal shower, right? And let's say that you've never been to a bridal shower before. And uh, for those of you, for all of us who have been to a bridal shower, what's the intent of the shower? It's to shower shower the, the bride with love, right? And so uh, I, I can testify, having received one, that, uh, oh my gosh, and then you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed. There's so many people here who love me. Like, it's awesome. And the gifts are a tangible expression of the love that the guests feel and the desire that they have to sort of get the bride and the groom started on, on a great path as their marriage begins. And so um, in this particular situation, the, the fool, in the context of the bridal shower, may have like 
heard of like gifts and they're like, oh, gifts. Okay, so I need to bring a box and wrap it for, for because we're going to unwrap this thing and for the bride and great. And they show up and then the box is empty. And you're like, and they're excited. They're like, I did it. I brought the box. Look at me go. But they've sort of missed the heart, which is to actually show the bride, oh my gosh, this is this is something that we've, we've purchased and set out for you. They've missed the heart of what's going on with the shower. And so for us today, I, I think the application can be fairly evident. Uh, when we show up for church on Sunday, we can be at risk of going through the motions. And I think especially as women, especially as women, we are always juggling about a million and a half balls all at the same time. And we are trying really hard not to drop any of them. And so it doesn't matter if they're big or if they're small, they are all going on in your brain simultaneously. And you're, you're, you're trying really hard to focus on the message and the songs and everything, but you're, you're thinking about your kid and you, you, about your neighbor and what's gonna happen after and the lunch and all the things that happen next week and at, at work and all of this stuff just sort of, is, it's very easy to lose track of what's going on in front of us. I know for myself, I, I, this is confession time, there have been times in church where, especially at, at the beginning of the service, where we sort of, he's like, okay, we're going to start singing. And I'm, and I'm like, oh, yeah, we're going to sing. And then a couple of stanzas in, I'm like, where am I? What have I been singing? What, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's going on? Or uh, after the service, it, uh, I remember driving home with Noah sometimes or whenever I go, go home with Josh, and they're like, so what did you think of the message? And I'm like, <laughs> well, what did you think? <laughs> and I'm like, I. You were there. I was there. <laughs> I thought I paid attention. Like I took notes, but I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what happened. And so the challenge for the wise person is to approach worship with a heart that is serious, ready to engage, and ready to respond. And so, moving on to the next couple of verses here. Be not rash with your mouth, and let not your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much business, and a fool's voice with many words. All right, so... What's going on with these verses? What's going on? Again, let's think about the context. If the context is we're at the house of worship, what what do we most often, we, the congregation, what do we do with our words when we show up for worship? I'm thinking of really two prayer. things. Singing, singing and praying. praying. Right, absolutely. So song and prayer. And if you think about it, what is singing but prayer set to mm -hmm. music, right? So it's we're really focusing in on on prayer there. Now, what I don't think that Kohala is saying is, hey, you know what? God's really busy. He's up there in heaven. He doesn't really care that much, so only send in your petitions once in a while. We don't want to bother God. That's, that's not what's going on here. What I think is what's going on is he's emphasizing God's transcendence. And every time I say that word, I want to add another syllable. I'm like, transcendence? No. no. <laughs> so I yeah, have transcendence. And God is so big he's so great he's so holy he's so good that that should pause us for just a moment whenever we go in to worship he it's he's so great that even as i'm describing i literally can't comprehend it but and i think this is a danger for all of us i can forget it i can forget it with our easy access to god our comfort in gathering together. And I think our, our culture's general tone of sort of lightheartedness and sort of, and fun, it doesn't take much for us to lose that reverential awe that's befitting for the God who is as high above us as the heavens are above the earth. And as, as I was sort of thinking about, well, what does this look like when it's done right? I, I, I thought, like the Roman Catholic Church, there are many things that I disagree with about sort of what they believe and what they do, but I, I do appreciate the solemnity with which they conduct their services, the traditionalness. And I don't, I don't like, 
if I did it every day, I don't know if I would appreciate it so much. <laughs> but it, whenever you go, there's a sense that there's something serious going on. There's there's a sort of weight that you feel that, oh, we are doing something really intentionally. And if we're in, I, I think that this, the times whenever I'm like, oh, like I feel something similar is like when we do communion and then our Christmas Eve and Good Friday services, there's, there's a different feel whenever you walk into the building. There's a different atmosphere and a, a, and, a, and a concentration. And I'm not saying that, by the way, that there's anything necessarily wrong with having fun and with, you know, sort of being silly sometimes. But I, I think that as generally speaking, if we were going to sort of weigh these two things out, that we would err on the side of not taking God seriously enough. And so the, the, the lesson sort of here is that we ought to both think before we speak and to think, sorry, to speak sparingly. So whenever we approach God, especially in prayer, and again, whenever we either pray or sing, there's a lot of, there, there's a, it's very easy to just jump into it and just sort of whatever, whenever we're praying, whatever pops into our, into our minds, we just sort of say, we go from one thing to the next, and whether it's in front of people or silently, it's really easy, or whenever we sing. Sometimes, I, and I, I appreciate whenever, Nick, whenever he introduces the new song in the month, will say, hey, don't necessarily just try to learn this tune right away. Stop and listen to listen to the words first really think about the message and I find myself sometimes that there's a song that I, I'm like oh I, I don't think I know it I won't sing and I'll, and I'll just think about the words because sometimes sometimes my brain is in the right spot and, and I am engaged and I and I do want to say well do I do I mean these words that I'm saying before God now these last of uh, the last verse here in this section is again kind of weird like, for a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. And you're like, what? That seems like a really weird because. He's like, so I'm pointing to this reason of for a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. And so uh, we have to interpret what it, what dream means. What it, what it probably doesn't mean is it doesn't mean a nightmare or a prophetic vision. So those are the two meanings of the word that it's probably not. The other two possible alternatives... Uh, first of all, it could mean something like, hey, you uh, had a really hard day at work, and so now you're sleeping really soundly, and in that really sound sleep, you've entered your REM cycle, and you're now 60 feet tall, and you're eating rainbows, and your guinea pig from when you were 10 years old is telling you that you're out of sauerkraut, and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to go to the store and get more sauerkraut, but the store's closed because it's Thanksgiving. <laughs> right, so it could be that kind of dream. And... You know, we, we make the joke all the time. Oh, yeah, I had this dream, but, you know, I had those burritos last night. Or, or again, you know, you, sometimes whenever you have that really hard day of work and there's a lot of things on your mind, you have those weird, crazy dreams, and you're like, oh, my gosh. And I, this person who was drowning in the river, and I was just so – and you're like, oh, well, I can see exactly where that dream – I can see where that dream came from. Um, you could also interpret this in the sense of aspirations. So uh, – have you ever met somebody who every time you talk to them they have this new great plan for th for something and they're like oh my gosh let me tell you i'm going to start this 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 chicken business and they and then the next time you talk to them they're they moved on to like weaving alpaca yarn and you're and you're like okay that's great and they're but they act, they never actually accomplish any of their plans they just sort of move from great aspiration to great aspiration so it doesn't really matter which way you, you interpret dreams in that sense, because either way, the meaning's the same. Uh, the dreams don't correspond to reality. They're gone in a moment, and they're worth nothing. So also are the words of the fool. They don't mean anything. They're gone in a moment, and they are not worth anything. And so... The exhortation is to show yourself not as a fool by those excessive, insubstantial, and worthless words. Moving forward. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than you should vow 
and not pay. Now, uh, uh, we have this introduction of the concept of vows. Now, typically when we think of vows today, what do you think of? Wedding. Yeah, you think of wedding vows. And that's pretty much it, right? We're like, okay, wedding vows, that's great, I'm done. <laughs> but uh, that's, not the, that's not really the focus here. So vows in the Jewish culture were an integral part of their worship. Um, they committed themselves to some type of action, usually the offering of sacrifices, if God would grant their request. And we see this throughout scripture. Uh, one example would be in Genesis 28. Uh, Jacob makes a vow after sort of fighting with the Lord and says, hey, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come up again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I've set up as a pillar, shall be God's house. And all of that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. And then I also have up there 1 Samuel 1, 10 through 11. So this is Hannah. And Hannah was barren, and so she was in bitter distress and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Now, in both of these examples, it seems that the, the characters do indeed fulfill their vows afterwards, and there's no negative outcomes, and there's no negative implication implied, and so, is making a vow to God wrong? No, so they're, making a vow is not wrong. In fact, we have some direct instruction about what to do with vows in Deuteronomy 23. Verse 21 starts out, If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay in fulfilling it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you. You may be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what is past your lips. For you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. So making vows isn't bad. But making hasty, impulsive promises that you don't keep is bad. So that's sort of the distinction here. And we understand this on a very human level, I think. So I have, I, I work at the Rock Gym in addition to coaching to teaching at the school and I'm always on the lookout for additional coaches because inevitably kids are switching out sports it doesn't matter why I need more workers I always need more workers at the rock gym and so occasionally I'll find myself in conversation with either a kid or a climber in the gym and I'll sort of wrap around to so would you ever be interested in coaching and sometimes they're like no <laughs> but sometimes they'll say something like well i'm not available for like a regular shift but oh my god i would love to help out when i can i'm like great i'll put you down as a sub <laughs> well that's great all those promises are well and good until the 17th time that i've asked them if they're willing to come in and sub and they're like oh no 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 i'm sorry i'm not available because then I'm, I'm suspecting that there really wasn't an intention to actually come and help out, but they just sort of wanted to, to sound good in the moment and to sound willing to help and whatever, make me happy, make, make me leave them alone, whatever whatever their, their motivation was, they didn't have, they didn't follow through on their promise. And so their words didn't mean anything to me. Now there are probably, there are two, at least two cases of promises gone way wrong in scripture. We're gonna look uh, at both of them, but for now we're just gonna look at Judges chapter 11. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but Judges 11 doesn't necessarily ring like, oh, of course, Judges chapter 11. So Judges 11 has the story of Jephthah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Jephthah was one of the judges that God had appointed, and he's facing the Amalekites. And even though Jephthah had been appointed by God to sort of kick out the Amalekites, Jephthah needed some additional assurance, and so he makes a vow to the Lord. He says, look, Lord, if you will help me drive out the Amalekites, then the first thing that comes out of my house, I will offer as a burnt sacrifice. Well, what's the first thing that comes out of his house? It's his daughter. Now, it's, this, is, this, is, this is one of the most, you're sort of in awe and horrified all at once because both he and his daughter were like, well, we vowed to the Lord, so you gotta, Dad, you gotta do, you gotta do it, Dad. Can I have a couple months to go mourn my virginity before, before you kill me? And, and so that they follow through, which is crazy. So that obviously, it, in this case, Jephthah would have been much better off not vowing, right? 
And I think even in this case, you know, so Leviticus 18 explicitly says, don't offer your children up as a sacrifice. You know, the Lord doesn't want this. Um, but so this is a this is a classic case of what not to do. Most of us, again, are not going around vowing to offer burnt offerings. So how does this connect with us today? Um, I think of things like uh, if you're in a really desperate situation, have you ever sort of thrown a promise to God? God, if you'll just do this one thing, then I promise. Now, I couldn't think of any promises. I was like trying to think through my life. I'm like, do I have any examples? And I was like, I, I, don't, I don't know if I think about this, but I did think about this sign that I had sort of hanging up in my house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And it's just sort of proclaimed and thrown out there. Now, this was a gift. And I, I, we chose to hang it up. Like, we were like, oh, this is a great time. We're going to hang it up. But there wasn't like a whole lot of forethought. We, it, it, there's not like an intentionality behind it. Now, does it describe our heart? Yeah, we want this to be true. But it's just sort of a promise that's sort of thrown out there to anybody who walks into our house. And um, whether or not we d intended to make that promise publicly or not, it's there. And we can sort of broaden out the idea of vows. Uh, and I, have you guys thought about financial vows? Like, our giving monetarily is an aspect of our worship. And I, I can remember once I received extra money. I can't remember the exact situation, it, but it wasn't like a regular income thing. It was like some, some gift or maybe it was during COVID when we were getting like those government checks or something. And... I was like excited because I was like, oh man, I can like I, I don't need this. Like it's just, just it's just extra, so I can I can give it to the church or whatever. And the guy that I was dating at the time was very into like the, the Dave Ramsey stuff and he was like, No, you have to put that toward your car because you can make some extra car payments. And I was like, I don't know. I'm like I had this compulsion in my heart to, to give, but on the other hand, like it and, and eventually I was like, okay, fine. So I paid off, you know, put it toward the car, but I was, that never sat well with me. That Like there's this, you know, I, I decided in my heart to give and then I allowed myself to be persuaded not to give. And I was like, hmm. And I think that that, it's, it's, not, it's not exactly a one-to-one -one correlation, but that sort of a, gets to the heart of what's, what's going on here. I think another area where we tend to be even more loose in our vows is with our time. Now, uh, I am a member of the modern world, right? So I uh, am sensitive to the fact that our lives come with many roles and responsibilities and it's, and it's difficult to juggle. Uh, however, and perhaps especially somebody who's in leadership who experiences things from that point and then also talks to other people who are in leadership and sort of hears a lot of stuff, I do regularly hear about you know people backing out of commitments, whether it's, hey, we were gonna meet with this person and then they sort of pulled out or, uh, there's, you know, this, this you know, thing that they committed to or the service opportunity and, oh man, now we have to find somebody else to X, Y, or Z. And I think in all of these areas, vowing but not following through dishonors God. And whether it's because we never really intended to follow through and we're just sort of making a show of it or if we just ended up losing steam and you know, tried putting it off so that we could be like, oh, I'm not, I'm not gonna be called on this, but I'm gonna sort of put it off. The result is the same. It perhaps demonstrates a desire to have a, like a good word in with God, but it lacks that discipline to follow through. And so does this please God? No. And Jesus himself testifies to this in Matthew 21, where he's ha he tells that parable of the two sons, and he's like, hey, the, this man had two sons. He asked the first one, hey, go and work in the field. And the son was like, no. <laughs> but later, what did he do? He went out and he actually worked in the field. And then he said to the other son, hey, son, go and work in the field. He said, I, I will work in the field. But, but then he did it. So which son pleased the father? The one that obeyed. The one who actually did it. The, the one who said, I'll do it. Did his words mean anything? No. Did his vow please, please his father? No. It didn't. So the next set of verses continues this theme continues to develop the idea of vows. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is heaven. 
but God is the one you must fear. Now, if you take the first part of verse 6 all on its own, like, you know, your mouth leads you into sin, uh, and you just sort of isolate that verse, all sorts of meanings fill your mind, right? So you're like, there's so many ways to sin with our mouths. You know, like gossip, there's lying, there's boasting, there's being demeaning to people, there's criticizing. Like, you can go on down the list. But I don't think that that's what's going on. Again, thinking about the context of the verses, both what just came before and the verse that comes after. It seems natural to connect this with the idea, again, of vows. Don't go back on what you've promised for what God you know, delivered, or you'll be led into sin by your mouth. And I think that there's really two ways that you can think about it. Again, Hebrew's a little bit loose here, so one thing that you could interpret it as is into punishment. So instead of into sin, it could be into punishment. And this links with the second couplet, why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? So that's a possible understanding of the verse that it's saying, hey, don't let your mouth lead you into punishment. Or you could think about, hey, if you go back on what you say that you're going to do to God, then that's a sin. So don't let your mouth lead you into sin that way. I think that either is very plausible, and frankly, because it's because it's Hebrew, it could actually be intended to be both at the same time. So I'm like, eh. Whichever, whichever one you, you land on, I think, works with this passage. I'm perhaps a little bit more um, partial to the first one because of the next couplet, but I'm not going to split hairs over this one. So the messenger, who is it? Well, the word can be translated angel, it can be translated messenger, but probably what's going on is that it's uh, some temple priest or some other type of temple personnel who's coming around to make good on the vow that you promised. Now remember, in this culture, your vow probably wasn't, well, hey, I'm going to Venmo the church, you know, $200 or whatever. What is, if they're going to make a vow, oftentimes it's probably going to be, you know, a cow, a calf, a, a, a lamb, a sheaf of grain. Oftentimes it's those, those tangible things, and you know they, they, maybe they don't always take it with them to the temple. And so apparently, especially in Kohelet's day, there was a specific designated role for somebody who was going to come along and collect your, what you promised. And what he's describing is you know, the messenger shows up at your door, and he's like, hey, I'm here for Bessie. And you're like, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, that was a typo. I didn't mean to write Bessie, I meant to write my Bestie. Bestie. <laughs> um, so he, he's saying, "Hey, don't, don't do this." So and, and, and even if the messenger believed you, even if they believed you, like, "Oh no, that was a mistake. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to." Does it matter? No, because who do you make the vow to? Do you make the vow to the messenger? No. No. Who would you make it to? You made it to God. And God is saying, "Well." That's a crappy excuse. <laughs> that is a lame excuse. And then, oh, no, that was a mistake. No, he knows. He knows the depths of our heart. He knows exactly what was going on. And we, we talked about how there were two classic examples of fouls gone wrong. The first one was from the Old Testament. The other one is from the New Testament. So we have Acts chapter 5. What happens in Acts chapter 5? Ananias and Sapphira, right? So what did they vow? They vowed, hey, we are selling this land and we are going to give the entire profit to the church. Look at how generous we are. And what did they do? They only gave part. They only gave part. And they made it seem like, oh, look at this super generous gift that we're giving, but they were actually profiting it from it. They were trying to eat their cake and have it too. And so they got the rare bam roasted <laughs> instantaneous annihilation response from the Lord. Now, probably... For the most part, if you go back on a vow that you offer to the Lord, that's not the immediate response that we're getting in our lives today, right? However, one commentator explained, so God cannot bless the life of one who flippantly tries to dispose of religious obligations and promises. Mm. Did you say that again? I, I can't. God cannot bless the life of one who flippantly tries to dispose of religious obligations. And I think that that, I was like, I must say that out loud. <laughs> I must say that out loud because that captures the heart of, I think, what's, what's being described here. 
Uh, it's not a promise that God is definitely going to wreak destruction in our lives, but it's definitely the opposite vibe of like we talked about with Psalm 90, where we are praying for the Lord to establish the work of our hands. Instead, we're putting our, the work of our hands in jeopardy. We're tempting fate by recklessly and carelessly retreating from the commitments that we've made before God. And so verse 7, I think, really sums up the entire section. And I'm going to sort of throw up on the screen the definition for hevel. And I'm going to read another commentary because I, 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 again, love this. So from Wearsby, people make empty vows because they live in a religious dream world. They think that words are the same as deeds. Their worship is not serious, so their words are not dependable. They enjoy the good feelings that come when they make their promises to God, but they do themselves more harm than good. They like to dream about fulfilling their vows, but they never get around to doing it. They practice a make-believe religion that neither glorifies God nor builds Christian character. And so their dreams and their words are held, insubstantial, empty, and worthless. Now, Kohelet's ultimate conclusion is, I think, a little bit masked in the English Standard Version. The, the Hebrew literally says, rather, fear God. And I think that that's, I think that that's the, the best translation of the passage, because what, what is better? To, what does a wise person do as they enter the presence of God? They don't go about with <coughs> empty words. No, they go in seriously with the intent of obedience. They pray with intent and solemnity, and they commit their decisions in all areas of worship to the Lord with a true reverential awe. And so that's five, one through seven, and that's, we did in fact need to break up that chapter. So um, if you are doing hike your own hike, the, the quote unquote homework, so the work at home, uh, you can do the checkpoint for this section and then the hit the trail application questions. Looking forward to next week, we are finishing up chapter five and doing three quarters of chapter six. Ooh. I know. Uh, you're going to see that chapter six and the last three verses of this section, so seven through nine, seems to wrap up the first half of the book. And then six, ten through twelve is going to springboard us into the next half of the book. So be on the lookout for that. We are finished.